Hello, and welcome to the Biomedical Acoustics Group Update at the 2020 Center for Acoustics and Vibration Fall Workshop. My name is Juliana Simon, and I am the group lead for the Biomedical Acoustics Group. I'm also an assistant professor of acoustics and biomedical engineering at Penn State. I'm joined in the group by 10 other faculty members, including our newest faculty member, Yun Jing, who started at the beginning of the calendar year uh, as an associate professor of acoustics and biomedical engineering. As a quick overview of this approximately 30 minute talks, I will give some updates on what the group's been up to, the student projects, group awards, which will then be followed by two talks by PhD candidates. The first will be given by Sumit Agrawal, who is a student of Dr. Raj Kothapali in biomedical engineering, who will talk about LED-based photoacoustic imaging. The other talk will be given by Molly Smallcomb, a student in my lab um, who's working on her PhD in acoustics on ultrasound histotripsy in tendons. The overarching goal of the Biomedical Acoustics Group is to understand and apply acoustic principles to improve human health. Within the group, we have projects ranging from imaging to therapy, experimental, and modeling. So we cover the whole gamut of biomedical acoustics. In fall 2019, we were able to invite Dr. Omer Aralkin from North Carolina State University to give a talk on CMUTs on glass substrates for imaging, sensing, and therapy. Unfortunately, our seminar for spring 2020 was canceled due to COVID, and we are still working to find a speaker for this current semester. A couple student projects a, post, a couple student projects will be highlighted in the student poster competition. The first is a talk called Passive Cavitation Imaging a Focused Ultrasound in an Elastic Phantom, given by Jacob Elliott, who is a student in my lab. The other poster will be given by, novel, by Hoang Chen on novel transparent ultrasound transducers in biomedical applications. And Hoang is advised by Dr. Raj Kothapali. Here's a list of some other ongoing student research. There are many other projects that are not listed, but these were the ones that I was most aware of. And so one is on metasurfaces. There's another one um, out of biomedical engineering on phase change nano droplets for drug delivery applications. We have some work in shear wave elastography and single muscle contraction, and some work on ultrasound detection of pathological biomineralizations. Some awards for members of our group. One is at Molly Smallcomb, who received, received her MS degree in acoustics in December of 2019. You saw her name listed because she's still working towards her, or she's still in the lab working towards her PhD. Uh, other awards are that Molly Smallcomb and Eric Rockney received the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, Molly in 2019 and Eric in 2020. Also, Dr. Yun Jing won the IEEE Ultrasonics, Ferroelectrics, and Frequency Control Star Ambassador Lectureship Award for the 2019-2020 year. And then I was awarded a National Science Foundation Career Grant. So that's the kind of up updates or general updates for my group. Next, we will hear a talk by Samit Agrawal on the LED-based photoacoustic imaging, followed by Molly Smallcomb's talk on ultrasound histotripsy and tendons. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Sumit Agrawal, and I am from the Department of Biomedical Engineering. I'm currently a fourth year PhD student working with Dr. Kothapali in Biophotonics and Ultrasound Imaging Lab. Today, I'm happy to talk a little bit about our lab's efforts in exploring the potential of LED-based photoacoustic imaging. The outline of my talk goes like this. First, I'm going to introduce biomedical photoacoustic imaging, and then I'll talk about our recent study where we compared the photoacoustic imaging capabilities of low power LED arrays with the high power laser sources. Next, I will introduce the LED based photoacoustic computer tomography system that was designed and developed first in our lab. Last part of my talk will touch on the applications of artificial intelligence for improving the performance of LED based photoacoustic imaging, specifically for deep tissue. Starting with the history, 
photoacoustic effect really was introduced by Alexander Bell in about 1880s. He encoded sound in some form of modulated light, and so he came up with the photoacoustic phenomena in the device he called a photophone. So what you talk will be recorded as modulation of light, and then that light can propagate over large distances using simply ray propagation. And then it will be kind of transformed from light back to the sound at the other end. Obviously, that technology didn't take off, but he was clever enough to describe all the principles of photoacoustics that are being used even today. The simplest way to think about photoacoustic imaging is the lightning and thunder. There is nothing more to it. So in this particular case, we have a lightning bolt, which is the form of electromagnetic energy. It interacts with the atmosphere, atmosphere being air. That air, because of interaction, will be very quickly heated up, and then there will be some deposition of thermal energy. And because of that energy, because it's a rapid event and you have a rapid deposition of thermal energy, the air around that lightning bolt will expand and will produce a sonic boom. And then all you have to do is to count. The point is very simple. You hear the effect, you listen to it, you count seconds that tells you how far the event is from. And based on the amount of sound you receive, you will realize how drastic that event is. We are going to use exactly the same concept for photoacoustics in biomedical field. So our lightning in this case will be a laser pulse that we are going to introduce into the tissue. By definition, tissue will have optical absorbers as pointed here, located somewhere inside the body. We don't know where, but we assume it's there. Once the photons will reach these optical absorbers, the optical absorbers will convert the energy from electromagnetic to thermal. That means very small deposition of temperature will take place. That deposition of temperature is the small fraction of the degree. So there should not be any thermal concerns or thermal damage if you wish. However, even the deposition of the temperature is very small there will be a large stress generated at specifically at the surface of the absorber because tissues are incompressible and no matter how small the temperature is, it will expand and generate acoustic waves. So because of these stresses produced, it will generate acoustic boom as you just saw here. And all you have to do is to start listening to the photoacoustic waves. The stronger the amplitude of the wave, the stronger is the optical absorber at a particular depth. And second, you will be listening at what time this particular echo arriving to you. That will tell you the distance between the optical absorber and the acoustic detector. So in principle, this very simple technology can produce depth result for acoustic images where contrast is primarily determined by optical absorption and the resolution is derived by the acoustic detection. So photoacoustic imaging, the simplest way to do is you take an expensive laser, such as shown here, the OPO laser, and integrate that with an ultrasound probe. The reason I say expensive laser is because A, it operates in pulsed mode, B, it has a higher power, and C, it can change the color. So it's a tunable laser. Through fiber optics, you will put that light to the tip of the ultrasound transducer, as you can see here. The ultrasound transducer is already integrated with the ultrasound imaging system, such as Verasonic systems as shown here. So this is the Verasonic system we have in our lab. We have this big laser in our lab and uh, we integrated the, the ultrasound probe with the fiber optics from the laser and the detection is to the Verasonic system. The video, the video shown here is a typical working ultrasound plus photoacoustic system that we built in our lab. You can see here there is a DAC called Verasonics, an ultrasound transducer probe, and a laser source. Here is your transducer probe, and here is your laser that is integrated with the fiber optic components to the probe. So the whole system is pretty bulky, and you can see that's almost size of a big room, and it's very expensive.
So that's how a typical photoacoustic systems look like. Now, moving forward, in order to do any clinical translation, specifically for resource limited settings, we have to make sure that our photoacoustic imaging systems are as portable as possible. So the one option uh, towards minimizing the size of the apparatus or even the cost of the system is to, re to replace the big and bulky lasers, which are OPO kind of lasers, with the alternative sources such as LEDs. Recently, these light emitting diode arrays have been becoming very popular in the photoacoustic community. So these LED arrays comes in different, different wavelengths. For example, you have 470 nanometers, 620 nanometers, 690, 850, and even you have dual wavelength arrays where you can have such as 850, 690 pair, the alternate rows here will be having a different wavelength. And you also have 750, 850 pair and so on. They have a very high repetition rate, which is in the order of kilohertz. So the LED arrays which I am using in our lab are, are actually the range of four kilohertz, which is way larger than the 10 hertz per pulse repetition frequency, what you typically get with a big OPO laser. So the point is, if we can use these LED arrays instead of the big OPO tunable lasers for deep tissue photoacoustic imaging, then that reduces the cost as well as size of the photoacoustic systems. And then we can directly translate the technology to the clinics, especially to the resource limited settings. So the next part of my talk is focusing on comparing the photoacoustic imaging performances from both these optical sources. This is a recent study we did where we actually performed photoacoustic imaging with both these sources in a way that they can be comparable. Here, this is a data acquisition system which can, which can be used with LED based uh, LED arrays. So here you can see that we have two LED arrays placed around the ultrasound probe. The probe is a seven megahertz probe, which is 128 element and a pitch of 0 0.3 millimeters. And uh, these, these LED arrays are connected with the data acquisition system here as shown. And the probe is also connected to the same system. There's a host controller PC, which controls the triggering of these LED arrays and also the acquisition of the photoacoustic waves. We designed a similar arrangement of laser fibers around the same probe so that we can acquire laser images and compare them with the LED array images. So here is an OPO laser, which is also triggered with the same data acquisition system. And we have taken an optical fiber bundle from the output of OPO laser and split that bundle into 20 different fibers, which are equal in aperture. And we have de designed these folders where these fibers are inserted. And there is a glass diffuser, which makes the illumination outside from the laser uniform. So you can see here that this is the figure G shows the illumination from these two LED arrays, which are 850 nanometer arrays. And figure H here shows the illumination using the laser fibers. Here the laser is also tuned to the same wavelength. So basically you can put the probe on the imaging subject with the LED arrays, and then you can remove these LEDs arrays and just put the fiber holders and acquire the frame. And you can then compare them without moving the subject. So with this setup, we have now performed various controlled and controlled studies in phantoms and also human studies to compare for deep tissue imaging, how the photoacoustic performance is for LED arrays versus the big lasers. So here is the first study where we took a highly scattering intralipid medium. As you can see here, it's a 20 centimeter inverse scattering medium where we inserted 0 0.5 millimeter diameter pencil leads along the depth. So with this phantom, we first performed imaging with the help of laser, tuning the laser at 850 nanometers. The output energy of the laser from these fibers was around 40 millijoules and the pulse repetition frequency as fixed is 10 Hertz. You can see all the four targets here are nicely detected, although there is a background noise. We repeated the experiment with the LED arrays. We just removed the laser fibers and we put the LED arrays back to the system. 
and then we perform the LED acquisition at different different frame rates. We use the same wavelength here, 850 nanometers. The output energy from these LED arrays is 400 microjoule, which is 200 microjoules for each array, and we are using two arrays, so there is the total energy of 400 microjoules. In first case, the repetition was such that the the obtained frame rate we got from the LED arrays was 30 hertz, and then we reduce the frame rate by increasing the frame averaging to see the effect of frame rate on the SNR. So we performed imaging at 30 hertz, 15 hertz, 10 hertz, which is same as laser, and we further reduce the averaging the frame rate to 6 hertz, 3 hertz, and 1.5 hertz. So these plots below are showing the performance of LEDs versus lasers at different frame rates. So for the first target, if you can see here the target at 15 millimeter depth, LEDs at 400 microjoule are performing far better than the lasers. And if you go down to the depth four, where you have a target at 34 millimeter depth, your LEDs at 400 microjoules are still performing better than lasers, but when you are having a very low frame rate. As you increase your frame rate, your lasers actually perform better. So at a 10 hertz frame rate, your laser SNR is little higher compared to the LEDs. Now let's look at the signal and noise separately for all these targets with all the frame rates to more precisely conclude anything about these performances. So here is the signal for all, for all of these four targets with laser at 10 hertz and LED at different frame rates. So let's just focus on the 10 hertz frame rate. So if you look at laser, your actual signal for target one, for example, is up to two log orders of magnitude higher as compared to the LEDs. And when you go down to target four, your, your laser still has up to two to three orders of magnitude higher signal for the fourth target. But when you look at the noise, even the noise for lasers is up to three orders of log magnitude higher compared to the LEDs, which is same for the target four. And when you calculate the signal to noise ratios, although for the shallow depth target, which is target one, two, and three, your laser at 10 Hertz is little lower in performance when comparing to the LED arrays. But when you go beyond 30 millimeters, that is the target four, which is at 34 millimeter depth, your signal to noise ratio for lasers is 48 dBs, whereas for LEDs, it's just 44 dBs. So as you go deeper, your laser shoots up, your laser performance shoots up. That's the conclusion of the first experimental study we did. We repeated this study with the chicken tissue phantom, which is more like a human tissue mimicking phantom. So what we did here is we placed five layers of chicken tissue, and in between each layer, we put one pencil lead of the same diameter. And then we performed the laser-based and LED array-based acquisition. So the first image show the ultrasound image where we can calculate the actual depth of the targets from the chicken tissue surface. So the first target was at 11 meter, millimeters and the second one was 18 millimeters and so on. So if you look at the laser image, you can identify all the four targets and you have a pretty low noise. So and if you compare the images acquired with the LEDs at different frame rates, especially for the fourth target, which is beyond 30 millimeter depth, the same observation is also seen here. For example, the SNR for the fourth target, when you, when you compare for lasers, it, it is higher at 10 Hertz when compared to the LEDs. So after these validations, we further went ahead to repeat the experiments to do the experiments at human wrist. So this is a human subject where we put the probe and we uh, image the vasculature inside human hand. So this is a B-mode ultrasound image with lasers. We could see the artery running just below the surface of the skin. And this is a co ultrasound and photoacoustic image. And for the same position, we also acquired the images with the LED arrays. So we, as you can see that for the radial artery, 
which is present below the skin surface, the SNR for the laser is around 36 dBs, whereas for the LEDs at the same repetition rate, which is 10 Hertz, is around 42.5 dBs. That is because the higher performance of LED array is uh, seen here because of the shallow depth of the vessel, which follows the trend of our previous phantom studies. So that means for, for shallow, shallow tissue imaging, with like up to at least 20 millimeters or so, your LED arrays are still performing better, although they have a two log orders of magnitude lower signal compared to the lasers, but because of lower noise, their performance is still better. The SNR obtained with the LEDs is still better. And on top of that, if you do higher frame averaging by compromising the frame rates, you can actually beat the lasers even at higher depth. So this is another study where we scanned the human, human forearm along this Y direction. And we obtained these 3D volumetric images, 3D volumetric photoacoustic images, and we obtained the maximum inten intensity projections, which is MIP, along the depth. So here, the first uh, result here shows, the figure B is the image for the laser acquisition, where we have shown here the full depth MIP for the human forearm. You can see all the vasculature being shown nicely here. And uh, the next image shown here is for the half depth, which is from 15 to 25 millimeter. Note that this 15 to 25 millimeter here is from the surface of the skin because the transducer is about 10, 14 to 15 millimeters above the skin surface. That's why we are taking the MIP after we reach the skin. So the first 10 millimeter MIP is uh, showing the shallow depth. And the next 10 millimeter MIP, which is in figure D, shows the deep tissue vessels, the deep tissue vasculature here. For the LED arrays, we have the same uh, experiment and we obtained the MIP for full depth, which is shown in figure F. And we also did the MIP for shallow depth, which is from 15 to 25 millimeter. You can see that all the vas vessels or the vasculature present in the human forearm is uh, detected with the LED arrays as well as with laser. But when we compare at deep tissue, that is from 25 to 35 millimeters of depth, you can see that some of the structures here are more highlighted as compared to the LED arrays. So that is when you cross 30 millimeters, you actually tend to lose some information. And that observation is well aligned with what we actually saw in our previous quantum controlled studies. Now, this is about B-mode for acoustic imaging, but uh, for clinical imaging of, for example, human hand or human fingers or even the foot, the more suited system setup is a tomography setup. So far in the literature, we only had B-mode for acoustic imaging systems with LED arrays. Although with big lasers, it's very easy to develop uh, photographic tomography system for deep tissue imaging, but so far no one has attempted to develop a LED based photoacoustic tomography system. This is the first time in our lab we developed a LED based photoacoustic computer tomography system which can perform 3D volumetric tomography of a subject. Uh, so in this case, what we did was we arranged four LED arrays instead of two around a circular geometry. This is an imaging tank. So let's look at the schematic first. So here we have this uh, rotating stage and we connect the imaging cylinder where we have four slots for LED arrays and one slot for ultrasound probe. So we attach four LED arrays and one ultrasound probe to this imaging cylinder. And this cylinder is attached to the rotation stage on the top. And this stage rotates th 360 degrees to perform a tomographic acquisition. Now the imaging subject has to go inside the cylinder and then when the stages rotate, you can acquire multiple B-mode images around the geometry, around the rotation of your cylindrical geometry. So in then you can reconstruct using standard reconstruction algorithms such as time reversal and you can generate 3D volumetric photoacoustic images. The another advantage of this setup is you can have multiple wavelengths of LED arrays because it has four slots. You can keep different, different LED wavelength arrays in different, different slots. That helps you 
to acquire photoacoustic images at multiple wavelengths and then you can unmix those images to find out your required chromophores map. So here, uh, this was a typical LED array B remote system where you attach two LED arrays with ultrasound probe. Instead of this system, we have now shifted to this system where we attach one probe here and four LED arrays around the geometry, and then we perform the tomographic acquisition. So this is a comparison of fluence when you have two LED arrays versus four LED arrays around the imaging geometry. So as obviously you can, uh, you can estimate that with four LED arrays, we have more uniform fluence along the whole deep, deep tissue region. So as you can see here along the depth, the two LED arrays fluence will reduce when you go more than 15 millimeters and it's very low fluence, which is not enough for imaging beyond 20 millimeters. Whereas with the four LED arrays, we have a uniform fluence along the deep tissue. So to validate this setup, we performed several phantom studies on the tissue mimicking phantoms. The first phantom here is an agarose gel phantom, which has 1.5% agarose and also 20 centimeter inverse optical scattering, which is mimicked using the interlipid scattering. So here we have inserted four pencil leads, as you can see here, and uh, we have tried to image these, this phantom with our geometry. So the image in D shows a 3D volumetric image, photoacoustic image obtained at 850 nanometer wavelength, where we can clearly see all the four LEDs being detected by the photoacoustics. If you compare this image with the normal B mode image, if you perform a B mode scan along the Z direction, then what happens in this image is you are missing the second pencil lead target because of the shadowing effect. So a big pencil lead target is shadowing the smaller pencil lead target too, as you can see here. Another disadvantage of the B-mode system is the, the deepest target, which is more than 30 millimeters deep, is, is obviously missing here in the B-mode image. That is because your fluence is not enough to penetrate as deep as 30 millimeters when you are actually doing in a high uh, interlipid scattering medium. So that's why our setup has an advantage in uh, removing those shadowing artifacts and also uh, detecting the deep tissue targets. Next, we also did imaging of uh, phantoms which had different, different chromophores. For example, here we took a oxy-rich blood tube and a melanin filled tube and embedded those two tubes inside the interlipid scattering medium. And this phantom we imaged using two wavelengths, 850 nanometer and 690 nanometer. So after obtaining the volumetric images at the two wavelengths, we also performed spectral unmixing by which we can separate the two chromophores from the two photoacoustic images shown here. So as you can see in figure D and E, the 850 nanometer and 690 nanometer wavelength photoacoustic images when spectrally unmixed, they can separate the oxy and the melanin tubes which were embedded in the phantom. Same thing we repeated for the indocyanogreen and the melanin tube, and we could also unmix both of these tubes. Now we also performed oxygen saturation by using a human finger mimicking phantom. Here we took an agarose phantom and we mimicked the shape of the finger. And we also inserted a bone as we have in the finger and we put one oxy tube and one deoxy tube inside the phantom. We did the 3D tomography at the two wavelengths, 850 nanometer and 690 nanometer, and we could especially separate or map the oxygen saturation of these two tubes. This is another study where we further increase the number of wavelengths. We put two LED arrays with 850 and 690 pair and we put one LED array pair with 470 nanometer wavelength. So we made a phantom with three different uh, chromophores. The first one is a melanin tube, second one is the indocyanogreen, and the third one is the methylene blue tube. The all three tubes are embedded in a scattering medium with an optical reduced scattering of 20 centimeter inverse. 
and we put this phantom in the imaging cylinder and we rotated the cylinder geometry to perform the tomography at three wavelengths. So these are the three images obtained at the three wavelengths. And by performing spectral unmixing, we could also separate all the three chromophores and map them spatially after unmixing. So this shows the power of LED-based photoacoustic imaging. And so as we have advantage with lasers, we can tune them at different wavelengths. With this experiment, we have proved that if you increase the number of wavelengths with LED arrays, you can also do the same thing with the LED arrays, even for the deep tissue. Now, our future direction towards this is to image animal and also uh, human imaging with our LED-based PSCT setup. So recently, another group from University of Twente, they have proposed another LED-based PSCT system in a recent paper in BOE. They've actually rotated the probe in 360 degrees, but uh, unlike us, they're only able to obtain one cross-sectional tomography frame instead of a 3D volume, what we have. And also the non-uniform light emulation from the four LED arrays in the setup shown here is also one disadvantage. Next part of my talk is focused on artificial intelligence for improving the photoacoustic imaging performance of LED arrays. Recently, we have tested the capability of CNNs. This is an encoder decoder based convolutional neural network. We recently developed this and we tested on the LED based photoacoustic images acquired for deep tissue for the absorbing targets located deeper than 30 millimeters. And we could see that the, the neural networks were able to actually perform better than the, than the standard beam forming techniques and we were able to detect those deep tissue targets with higher SNRs. But any deep learning uh, technique before becoming useful, it has to be trained with a lot of lot of data. So there are actually uh, this limitation with us that to in order to make it effective, we need to obtain a lot of either experimental data or we have to go with simulations. So towards this direction, my uh, one of my previous, uh, my second year work was focused on developing such simulation platform, which can really mimic the tissue imaging and it can give us the photoacoustic and ultrasound images for the deep tissue. So in this case, uh, I have developed this platform in MATLAB where you can define an optical and the acoustic medium as heterogeneous as you want. For example, here I have defined nine different absorbing targets where targets shown in black are having a higher optical absorption, whereas the targets shown in red are not having, a high, not having any higher optical absorption. So they, they should not be detected in the photoacoustics. And the, the medium uh, in this here is a heterogeneous tissue medium. So first we obtain the fluence map using a NIR fast toolbox. This toolbox is basically performing the diffuse optics. So here you're obtaining the fluence map in a, in a tissue medium where this fluence is then multiplied with the absorption map in the tissue and you get the corresponding initial pressure. So this initial pressure is then fed to the K-wave toolbox. So where you propagate these pressure waves and you obtain the received photoacoustic uh, output at each transducer location. So then after doing a beam forming over these uh, obtained photoacoustic waves, you can generate the photoacoustic images. And same way you can also generate the ultrasound images where you don't need the, the fluence, but you need a ultrasound propagation and the back propagation. So here you can see that the ultrasound image can detect all the nine targets, whereas the photoacoustic image can only see the targets which are having higher optical absorption. And we can also co-register them and show that the show the both anatomical and the molecular information on the, photo, on the ultrasound plus photoacoustic image as shown in the figure I. So, so this work was uh, selected for oral in last year's SPIE. And we also use the simulation platform to develop, to simulate um, so many data, data sets for our artificial intelligence applications. One of the paper was published in IEEE last year. So this is another example where we used our simulation platform to 
obtain the photoacoustic images at different different optical scattering coefficient for example we varied the mu s prime which is the reduced optical scattering coefficient from 1 cm inverse to 10 cm inverse and 20 cm inverse so as you can see with the increased scattering the the deep tissue fluence is reduced and that's why the capability to detect the deep tissue targets reduces so this is kind of mimicking the actual realistic scenario where as you have more attenuation as you have more optical scattering you have more attenuation so that means the amount of fluence that reaches the deep tissue is low and because of that the uh, the amount of photoacoustic pressure generated is also low and in effect you cannot detect those targets with the transducers which are placed outside your body so that's what is happening here when you have a very high optical scattering your target located at the fourth position here is not detected with a standard technique and we will see that how with deep learning these kind of targets are also being able to detect so this is the uh, normal b mode led based uh, photoacoustic system where we put this ultrasound probe with the two led arrays and there is a pencil led target in the water medium and as we increase the optical scattering by by uh, pouring uh, the amount, the more amount of intralipid then we will see how the photoacoustic performance degrades so this is uh, here we have a 0.5 mm pencil lead target at 3 cm depth and we are actually increasing the intralipid such that the optical scattering is increased from 0 cm inverse which is water to 5 cm inverse 10 15 and 20 so here you can see the top row shows the raw photoacoustic data obtained from the system. The middle row shows the output of CNNs where we, we input this raw photoacoustic data and the, the output is your heat map which is showing the location of your targets. And the bottom row shows the corresponding output using the standard beam forming techniques. So as you can see, as we go here from zero to five, 10 and 15 centimeter inverse, you're not able to detect the targets which are three centimeter deep with using the standard beam forming technique. Whereas with the deep, with the, with the deep learning uh, architecture, when you put this data, which is buried in the noise, your, your, your algorithm is still able to detect your target. However, currently we are still not able to detect the targets very confidently when you go deeper than, uh, when you go more than 15 centimeter inverse scattering. So the feature direction is to further enhance the signal to noise ratio and being able to detect those deeper targets buried inside huge optical noise. So this is one of the paper from uh, Imad Bokhtar's uh, group published in 2018 where they used the photoacoustic beam formed images and they improved the signal to noise ratio when using 200 averaging versus 1000 averaging versus 2000 averaging. So they have shown for a human finger that the vessels present in human finger can be, uh, the SNR for those vessel, vessels can be improved when you apply CNNs and the architecture they have shown there. So in this way, the LED based photoacoustic imaging has a huge potential for clinical translation provided we do a proper instrumentation, we improve the imaging performance from the instrumentation side, and also we improve the performance using st uh, the state-of-the-art deep learning algorithms by increasing the SNR or by increasing the frame rate or by different different artificial intelligence techniques such as artifact removal, etc. So with this, I would like to thank all our funding agencies especially NIH, NIBAB, and the NVIDIA, and also the Penn State College of Engineering and Cancer Institute. I would also like to acknowledge the, the recent R21, R33 grant that we received. So the grant is actually uh, focused on developing a portable photoacoustic device. So this is a five-year grant where the first two years will be focused on developing the portable device, and the last, two, last three years will be focused on using that device in uh, resource limited settings such as in Ghana in India, where we will be imaging patients of peripheral artery, artery disease. So with this, I would like to thank each of you for listening to my talk.
and i would uh, like to say that led based photoacoustic imaging has really a huge potential to translate to the clinics thank you very much Hello, my name is Molly Smalcom. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the graduate program in acoustics, and I work with Dr. Simon in our basal group. Today, I would like to give you a little general information on my research and also show you some results that we've obtained recently. So my research deals with therapeutic focus ultrasound and looking at its feasibility to create disruption in tendon. Tendons are these tough, flexible cords of collagen fibers that connect our muscle to our bone. And though these fibers are highly elastic, they have high strength because they can be used every day, um, these, these fibers can still tear from a number of routine activities, including overuse, excessive loading, or aging like that. In fact, nearly 30 million attendant injuries occur each year in America and cost around $114 billion to treat. Even when a tendon does heal, it usually results in an overall weaker tendon. And that's why a lot of them need help in the rehealing because what can occur is this collagen fiber disorganization. So these fibers are no longer in this parallel long orientation, which makes them strong. We can have scar tissue or calcifications that form into the area, which inhibit its full use. And in general, we have a low vascularization in tendons, so there's not a lot of blood flow, so it's hard to get healing factors naturally to the area to help heal the tendon. There are many therapies that exist to treat these chronically injured tendons. Open surgery would, of course, be the most invasive, but a more common surgery now is arthroscopic surgery, where you insert only a camera and other probes instead to remove any scar tissue or calcifications. Though typically, both of these surgeries result in post-operative complications and you can get stiff joints, so people tend to lean towards more of the conservative therapies before going surgical. So kind of middle of the road, we have this dry needling conservative treatment where you insert an acupuncture sized needle multiple times into your tendon in order to introduce a micro damage, which then creates some sort of healing response. So this is a similar idea to when you work out, you're creating these micro tears in your muscle, that's why you're in pain after, um, but these micro tears help rebuild and strengthen your tissue after the therapy. A more non-invasive version of this is called extracorporeal shockwave therapy, so now you're outside of the body but you introduce a shock wave in order to create a micro damage or create some sort of stimulation effect to hopefully introduce your healing effects. And then of course we have physical therapy. Both the common theme among all of these is that they have very mixed success rates. And why we're, look, we're in the need for a new therapy in this field. This brings us to our idea of focus ultrasound as a new therapeutic. This type of therapy can create high acoustic intensities by focusing our acoustic energy into a well-defined volume deep in the body. Now, this is a, also a controllable therapy because you can create different types of damage. On the extreme ends, you have this thermal ablation and then this mechanical fractionation. So those are the kind of two mechanisms involved. On the very extreme end, with, with just using thermal effects, you cook the tissue, and that's what denatures your cells and creates the cell death. Though the side we're more interested in to kind of create that idea of mechanic or of of the micro damage is this mechanical fractionation. On the extreme end, you use the use of bubbles to homogenize and chew up the tissue into um, or fractionating these tissues so they're no longer alive but you now have this liquid slurry and a distinct border between that slurry that could be resorbed to the body and your normal tissue that you didn't want to treat. This term is called hysotripsy. There are two methods that have been found to create this homogenized effect. One is called cavitation cloud hysotripsy, where you initiate, oscillate, and collapse a bunch of cavitation bubbles within this cloud that happens 
within the focal volume. This effect creates stresses on the on the tissue and that's what can chew it up and make it into subcellular fragments. Another method is called boiling hystripsy where you use shockwave heating that can um, create boiling bubbles within the matter of milliseconds, but you keep your pulse short enough where you're not getting into this more thermal realm. And then within the bubble, you, you create this pressure release interface and that's what can atomize tissue along with creating some cavitation bubbles too. Though, obviously where my research comes into play, nine, neither of these methods have proven effective to collagenous tissues like tendon. They're used, they can be used on liver and kidney, but they haven't really found a place in the realm of these collagenous or connective tissues. So we've done some preliminary work on ex vivo rat tendons using just conventional boiling hystripsy parameters. And the results showed that bubbles were successfully creating, being created in the tendon, shown in our ultrasound imaging as this hyperactivity or these bright spots that occur from the highly reflective gas bubbles that are being introduced. So we also took samples and looked them underneath the microscope or looking at histology and diff did different stains to look at the different cellular changes that were occurring from the focus ultrasound treatment. So in the center, we have an h &E stain that shows a cellular structure, and that was showing that our fibers were melting and clumping together, showing that there was some thermocoagulative necrosis going on. And this was also indicated in the right stain called an NADH stain, which looks at enzymatic activity, or if you see a lack of stain, that would be considered cell death and we see a distinct border in that is a focal region, proving that we had this more thermal realm rather than the intended mechanical fractionation realm. So this is what brought us to our new goal, expanding our parameter space and identifying the needed parameters to create our desired mechanical fractionation, even if it's not the total homogenization, to create this controllable type microdamage for our our potentially new tendon therapy. Here are some results from expanding our parameters. We have kind of what came out of this three different disruption types. On the left-hand side of the most minimal type was this localized fiber separation when our samples are treated with our shorter, quicker pulses, which would be more in that cloud cavitation hystripsy realm. So in our H and E stain, we see that our cells are still intact. You see the purple dots or nuclei still intact and no fraying of the fibers. And we also see that matching in our NADH stain of that fiber separation. Then we saw other trends of um, localized cavitation disruption, which is seen disruptions in the fiber pattern. And that was when we decreased our time of treatment. And there was no indication of cell death in the NADH stain. But when we started increasing that time, like shown in the right case, we started seeing that more thermocoagulative necrosis in some of our samples where we have the clear cell death and lack of stain in the NADH, and we have the clumping of the fibers and starting to get a more a darker stain um, showing that there were thermal effects. So from these results, we have ongoing work in a number of fields. We are working in conjunction with biomechanics lab on campus to see if the focus ultrasound treatment has major influences on our mechanical properties of the tendon and whether it can preserve the mechanical integrity. Then we will be looking at uh, in vivo survival study in rats to see if this treatment can actually induce a healing response in an injured tendon. And then kind of going on a different pathway, um, kind of looking more into the fundamentals of why we can't get that pure homogenization from histotripsy. So we are creating the, bu the bubbles, but whether it's the, if it's a large enough size, maybe the, the collapse isn't violent enough, um, what's kind of inhibiting us from creating enough stresses to fractionate the tendon more. I would like to thank Dr. Megan Vitt and the movement of the Upper Limb Shoulder Lab, the biomechanics lab on campus, and Dr. Yaknim Wang for help with histology reading, 
as well as my lab, own lab at Basil. And of course, would like to thank all these funding providers for helping me move my research along. So thank you again for listening today. Uh, again, my name is Molly Smalcom, and here's my email provided. Um, I would love for you to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.